I'm really interested in telling our stories in New Zealand. I am very interested in history. I'm very interested in, you know, making sense of the world, the present world, the past world, learning from, you know, what's happened in the past and that kind of thing. I, when I was growing up, I was a huge film fan. I grew up all around New Zealand. My father was in the bank and we used to move every three years, so I lived in a lot of um, towns in New Zealand. But I say I come from Hastings because that's where I went to high school. And I was a big movie goer. I went, I went to the movies a lot and I used to argue with my father about seeing a movie more than once because he used to think it was a waste of money. I met Gaylene at Cannes in the New Zealand Film Commission office at Cannes. I was there with John Lang and we had just um, delivered um, The Lost Tribe. It was quite extraordinary because we lived in the same suburb. We'd grown up you know, in quite a, in, with quite parallel lives. She grew up in Napier, I grew up in Hastings. We didn't know each other. We'd heard of each other. We had a lot of friends in common. And then suddenly we met in the south of France. And we just talked a lot. We talked about what she was doing, what she wanted to do. I had a pretty active career at that time working in um, commercials. I mean, I wasn't really looking for any more work, but I think she decided that I kind of had the qualification she was looking for in a producer. So she asked me if I'd produce her film, and I really just thought she was joking and didn't think too much of it. But uh, when we got back, she approached me again, and we took off, and we did Mr Wrong together. We made an application to the Film Commission to get funding for the film and basically we were told to go away and get a man. It was quite, it's quite stunning when you think about it today. Um, they really just couldn't cope with the fact that there were two women who'd come to the table and, and were really worried that we didn't know what we were doing and thought we needed a man to sort of sort us out. So that, that was quite an interesting experience. But of course, that made us more determined. Because I mean, the one thing that Gaylene and I both have is this kind of determination and contrariness. If somebody says you can't do something, well, that just makes us all the more determined to do it. So that was good. That was really good. It was quite good being turned away because then we just came back. You know, We did get a man. We got Don Reynolds. He came and helped us. And he so he had arranged for the funding under the tax regime. Uh, as well as the you know film film commission money, the money just didn't eventuate. The whole thing sort of fell over. We didn't couldn't decide whether we would stop shooting, whether we would keep going, or what we should do because we clearly didn't have enough money to make the film. So anyway, the crew were determined to keep shooting it. They couldn't see any reason to stop you know uh, to stop shooting the film, and they just decided that we would sort it all out after the event, which we did. It was an interesting time again because we said when we made that film and they said, who's the audience? We said, well, the primary audience is women. And we were told women are not an audience. So um, we knew that we'd made a film that would appeal to women just because of the whole genre bending thing um, about it. And um, but no, they wouldn't they wouldn't buy that at all. So anyway, Bill accepted the film for the film festival and it played in the film festival to sell out audiences. And then TVNZ had said they might have a look at it. But then since it had sell out audiences, they decided everybody had seen it. So then we thought we were just going to, and the distributors weren't interested because they were pretty much thinking the same thing. So then we just decided we would distribute it ourselves. So we actually four-walled the, um, the theatre, the Paramount Cinema, which was a porn theatre in those days. So not only you know, were we paying for the cinema, we were kind of having to turn around the audience who was prepared to go to, go to the cinema. It was complete madness when I think about it now. But we did a really good first week and in the um, manager in the end said he would take it over. I mean, that just served to encourage us, actually, because, <laughs> because it was really, I mean, from our point of view, it was very successful. And we took it to Cannes, it sold at Cannes, immediately it sold to an American company, and it's remained licensed. They just renew the license every time it comes up. So it's stayed in the market there, it's on the school syllabus here. So, I mean, that film just goes on and on. So on Mr Wrong we bought a car, on Ruby and Rata we bought a house. We had to find a location, but it's quite hard to find a location which is a house and then get people to move out of it. And we decided in the end that the best thing for us to do was to buy a house, to buy a house and sell it again, which is what we did with the car. So, um, so we looked for a house to buy and um, gave... <laughs> I remember when we, when we were looking at this particular house that we actually ended up with for the location, Gaylene went with Rob Gillies, who was the production designer, and they pretended to be a couple. 
buying this house because they didn't want anyone to think they were buying it for a film because they thought the price would be jacked up. So they went and just pretended to be a couple buying a house and that was how we did it. Bread and Roses was extremely challenging because of the size of the production, because there were so many people, because it covered so many years. And because we, were we had to shoot it all in Wellington, we couldn't move about the country. So we were making do with the locations you know, that we could find in Wellington. We also built a lot of sets. When we decided we really wanted to get the rights and to tell the story, and we had to talk with Sonia about it, um, we were wanting to propose Graham as the writer for it because we thought he was right, he understood the period and everything. But we were worried that Sonia might say no, you know, she wanted a woman to write it, but he completely won her over. It was How great. Did he, do that? he just, you know, one lunch he'd won her over. It was fantastic. <laughs> and from then on, he was the one to do it. He just really understood about the kind of stories that we were interested in telling. He understood about character. He, he loved writing characters. He loved writing dialogue. And um, we miss him sorely as a collaborator. I really enjoyed working with uh, Nikki on Vintner's Luck. It was a real, I hadn't worked with her before. I, in fact, I didn't even really know her very well when I went on to the film, but I found her really a very, very good director to work with. She's very, um, she has a very strong idea of what she wants to do and where she's going, and she's very good at communicating that to everybody she's working with. And, you know, shooting in, in, in a foreign country, of course, that was a great asset because very quickly she was able to convey to everybody what she was doing and which direction we were heading in. I wanted to work with emerging filmmakers. I wanted to be able to work, you know, to give, to give them an opportunity to be able to, you know, to put their story on screen. And of course, short film is the best way of doing that. So I really enjoyed the experience and I loved working with, you know, Christine Jeffs on Stroke, which was her first short film. I worked with um, Brita McVeigh on Thinking About Sleep and I worked with Anna Reeves on Imploding Self. All good experiences. Well, I recall that at one stage I had a lot of approaches from people with stories that they wanted to tell, and they were sort of neither shorts nor, nor features. They were, they were maybe one-hour television stories, and I thought, well, it would be really good to put all these together and maybe just make a little television drama series. And I was thinking that there needed to be more New Zealand drama on TV, and especially on that Sunday night slot, which is where the serious drama went. And, they, and so I found stories that were all really about something that I thought was important, and we managed to get the financing from New Zealand On Air and from a broadcaster, and we made them. I worked with Shirley Horrocks on A Flip and Two Twisters, which was the story of Len Lai's kinetic sculptures. But I do like working with Shirley because she makes arts documentaries, and I do love arts documentaries, and it's a form that, for many years, it was quite difficult to get them financed. Um, but somehow she always managed to do it and if she couldn't get them financed she would just start shooting until she could get them financed and that's the way she's gone on and I've always enjoyed helping her with those films because I think they're really important. I think it's really important to record our artists and what they've done, what they've achieved and who they are and particularly to record them while they're still alive so that they can actually speak for themselves. I think it's impossible to understand how it was uh, for women today to understand how it was when we first started out because the world has changed so much. Um, nobody would ever tell you now that you needed a man on your team. Um, everything has changed. And I, but I also think well, the other thing that's changed is that I think that women's stories are acceptable now in the marketplace. I think it was very difficult uh, to be able to get stories that were more about feeling and understanding and making sense of the world around you. It was very hard to get those films financed and to get them on screens. I don't think it is so difficult these days for that. Mm -hmm.